Yeah, thanks again for having me this morning. And it's, it's really so fantastic to be part of this community that uh, I've heard so much about uh, in your support for Sophia and Peter over the years and how you've journeyed with them uh, through, yeah, sometimes also hard times. And uh, I especially remember like uh, 2009, I think, uh, I'd been in country with them again for a year and they went home on home leave and it was a rough time. And I think thanks to you, they were able to come back. and. That was a great relief to me as well. <laughs> yeah, so today we want to look at a story that actually I've told many times to Muslim friends, uh, parents of children with disabilities, local staff, but I've actually never preached about. And so it was a great uh, challenge and delight to, to actually go into this text again and say, what does it actually mean for us as believers? What does it mean for us as the body of Christ uh, to read this story? Because it's quite a different angle if you tell a story to somebody who maybe believes in God, uh, but doesn't know that loving mercy and kindness, and that's what you want to show, the moral values, the invitation. You want to see if people might kind of catch a spark and might be interested in, in starting to read the Bible with you or hear more about this God that uh, cares for this man with a disability. Or if you're quite different if you're talking to a group like you guys. But even with more studies, I think I, I kept staying at that place where the heart of the passage is an invitation to the table. And an invitation to sit and eat and have fellowship, which we're going to do later together as well but also an invitation to be part of community with God, but also with each other. And yeah, so that's what I really want to unpack more. How does God call us into that community? And how can we call, go and seek and find others that he wants to be part of this community who are not here yet? But let us hear the passage first, and Sophia is going to read it for us so I don't stumble over all the English pronunciation of all the weird names. <laughs> Thanks. I'm reading from 2 Samuel chapter 9, David and Mephibosheth. David asked, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul for, to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David and the king said to him, are you Ziba? At your service, he replied. The king asked, is there still no one alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, There is still a son of Jonathan, and he is lame in both his feet. Where is he? the king asked. Ziba answered, He is at the house of Makir, son of Amiel, in Lodabar. So King David had him brought from Lodabar and from the house of Makir, son of Amiel. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay honour to him. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and he said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and he said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and to his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, the grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, Your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah, and all the members of Ziba's household were the servants of Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem and because he always ate at the king's table and he was lame in both feet. 
Thank you, Sophia. A few years ago, in the larger organization that Operation Mercy is part of, we had a lot of discussion about equal participation of all our workers uh, that were serving cross-culturally. And a question that was used a lot, a phrase that was used a lot, was who has a seat at the table? And as people discussed this and discussed differences in power and different areas of the organization, people started describing that there were two tables. One of the privileged, the people were sent from the global north, from countries like Australia or Germany or the US or Canada, UK. People with churches behind them that funded them well, people who could afford a laptop and a nice phone, people who had good internet in their offices, and there was a second table with a new emerging group of workers that were called to serve in God's kingdom cross-culturally, but that came from countries where people were literally praying for the daily bread, that had no access to technology, and that were disadvantaged in so many places. And it seemed that there were two tables. And I think maybe you have seen caricatures of this also in world politics and other areas where there's this big nice table with all the rich big fat people and then a little table often with people with uh, African or other global south features. And we discovered to our horror that this is true in the kingdom of God or in something that should show the ways of the kingdom of God, so in a Christian organization. And there was this call for a third table, a third table that would represent the diversity and the unity that the kingdom of God should really show, that should show the inclusion of all people, and that would be a table that all would be a part of, and that would really be a picture, a symbol for God's kingdom. It would be a table that's like what's described in Luke 14, where the king sends out invitations for the great banquet. And in the end, he, he sends out his servant to go and seek people that are poor, crippled, blind, and lame to come and sit at that table and be part of God's kingdom. And I think this story of Mephibosheth is a foreshadowing. It's like an Old Testament narrative story of what Jesus then gives us in, in his parable in Luke 14. It's a sign and a symbol through the ages of God's mercy and an invitation to his table. There are great parallels between the parable and this story of, in terms that the servant is sent out to go and find um, he finds somebody or people with uh, disadvantages, with disabilities, and then this invitation to the banquet table. But let's look a bit more at Mephobichet. I knew I couldn't say his name. Mephobichet <laughs> in, in some detail. And, and where did he come from? What happened to him? So in, in 2 Samuel 4, we read uh, that when he was five years old, um, Saul and Jonathan were killed. and the family was fleeing, probably afraid of some repercussions, and a nurse grabbed the child and she dropped him. And from there on, uh, he was lame in both feet. Now that sounds exactly like stories I've heard a hundred times uh, in Central Asia when I was working with the children with disabilities. Um, dropped at birth, fallen off a table, giving a wrong injection, always blame somebody outside the family take away the shame from the parents to have given birth to a child with a club foot, a cerebral palsy, spina bifida, or anything else. Now we read this story in the Bible, so maybe it is literally true, um, but maybe it is the truth of the culture. Maybe it is the truth of the shame that's attached to having a kid like this. 
Maybe it's the truth of being hidden away, disguised, and kind of shifting the blame from the very beginning. It is the truth that believes somebody did something wrong for this to happen. Something that still echoes a thousand years later in the disciples when they go to Jesus and say, who sent this man or his parents when they meet the blind person? So Mephobishet is a man living in the shadows, in the margins of society, hidden away since childhood most likely. He calls himself a dead dog. I mean, there's some, not much more horrible that you can think of calling yourself. That's the label he attaches to himself. Initially because of shame, but then I think also because he was afraid. There were people still out there for revenge over what Saul and Jonathan had done. And we see that later in 2 Samuel 21 that I mean, it was for good reason that he was afraid um, because the Gibeonites asked David for permission to slaughter uh, the rest of the family and two of his uncles and five cousins get killed horribly. But David again in this situation says, but I have sworn an oath to protect Jonathan's children. And uh, he says, the king spared Mephobosheth and the son of Saul, of the son of Jonathan, because of the oath, the Lord, uh, that Lord of, the, oh, sorry, the oath of the Lord that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. So David was, had promised, he had sworn an oath to show kindness. Loving kindness, God's hesed, says in Hebrew. Something that David maybe learned from great grandma and great grandpa Ruth and Boaz, who we read the whole book of Ruth about this loving kindness of God. And this was passed on to David. He understood what this kindness actually meant. And so David sends out the servant to look for the descendant of Jonathan. And yes, there is someone, but he's lame in both feet. And I think in this instance, having been hidden away, being somebody that nobody pays attention to, being somebody that nobody feels threatened by, was a real blessing. Because when Saul's family was hated and persecuted, and Povichet kind of was able to stay in the sidelines and not get involved. No one had paid attention to the lame one. And so often we find ourselves arguing with God over not healing, not giving us what we're praying for. But the blessing might actually be in the not receiving. Because God has already poured out his loving kindness like a shield over our lives. I remember a pastor in Central Asia we worked with in the early days, and he had very bad epilepsy as a child. His parents took him to many of the kind of folk healers and shamans, and it became worse and worse. Um, probably through the medical conditions, some demonic or other things were added on. So when he became a believer, they prayed over him for healing, and he got a lot better, but he still had fits about once a month. So my interpretation is that God removed all the spiritual oppression and the demonic stuff, but the medical condition actually stayed. Why? He struggled so much with this. Ten years later, uh, all of us had left the country at the time. Uh, persecution of the believers became really strong. He was arrested by the secret police. As they took him in, they asked for his passport and all his paperwork, and he gave his disability card. And they said, oh, you're disabled. Well, then we can't keep you overnight, and you can go home. 
having this epilepsy once a month, which was by now treated with med medication, and he was doing really well, saved him from prison and possibly worse things. Sometimes you don't see the blessing in the unanswered prayers. So Mephobisheth was found and brought to David, and he must have thought, well, now my last hours come. I mean, he, he didn't know about this oath between Jonathan and David. He must have been so afraid. But then David says this sentence that to me is like the key passage of this whole chapter and that I want to unpack a bit more. He says, don't be afraid for I will surely show your kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. So in this sentence and then in the follow-up from that, David does three things that I want to take us through. First, he takes away fear, and instead of responding as Mephosheth was expecting with anger and wrath, he takes away the fear and speaks loving kindness. And this is the character of God. The one incident where David, who is in no way without fault, and you talked a lot about that last week, I believe, is truly the man after God's heart where he reflects the spirit of God that rests upon him so lovingly, where he's singled out as a forebearer of the Messiah in God's ultimate kindness and mercy and grace that replaces all anger and revenge and wrath towards us. Where we deserve wrath for our missteps, for our sin, our failures, where we are afraid, there's only loving kindness from God's side. We belong to a people, to human beings who have rebelled against God, God our King. And from the very beginning and through our own personal history, we show that rebellion again and again. We belong to a people of shame that since Adam and Eve is hiding in the shadows, afraid of what God will do when he finds them. Like Mephobishet was afraid what David would do when he finds him. He who belonged to the group, to the family that rebelled against this king. But God takes away all fear, and instead of wrath, he gives us loving kindness. Wherever we are anxious, worried, or afraid, he says to each one of us this morning, do not be afraid. I will show you kindness. The second thing is he restores. David restores to Mephibosheth the land, the servants, and most of all, he restores his honor. The name Mephibosheth means scatterer of shame, but it can also be read as breather of shame. And initially, that's quite confusing because these two things seem to be opposite, right? Uh, but again, if I was thinking back to my experience in Central Asia, uh, where m names really matter, I often saw children that were given names that seemed to be in opposition to the experience the parents had at their birth. So premature children or children that had a visible disability at birth were often called life or hope. Or a child that was born blind was called light or beautiful eyes. And I even met a girl once that was called boy. The parents were really desperate for a son. So the name shows what people had hoped for, 
and what they were hoping would come still in the future. So Mephobosheth is the one breathing shame, but also the may he be the breaker of shame, the scatter of shame. May he overcome shame in his life and for us as a family. And that is exactly what God does. Through God's loving kindness, David demonstrates the power that does not only forgive and cancel sin, but it makes the one who breathed shame in his every breath the one who scatters shame, whose shame is scattered in the wind. He makes the one who was embodying shame for his family to the one who brings honor to them, the one who is restored in his identity and in it as his heir of Saul. He gets all the land and all the riches that belong to Saul. He's restored to his birthright and to his possessions. But we carry shame for things that we have done that maybe only we ourselves know. Or we carry shame because of something in our family, circumstances that have nothing to do with us. Or because of some label that we have given to ourselves or maybe other people have given to us. Where we carry that shame, God wants to restore us to our inheritance. We are co-heirs with Christ. In Romans 8, 15 to 17, Paul kind of does a wonderful New Testament theology about that. And it's exactly the same thing that the Old Testament tells us in this story of restoration, of the adoption of Mephibosheth into David's household. Romans 8 says, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if we are children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in that order we may also be glorified with him. What a turnaround. Fear removed through kindness. Shame scattered. No longer a slave of fear and shame, but restored to his inheritance. And third, David offers a seat at his table. He says, you will always eat with me. David doesn't just offer recompense, kind of like it happens in politics today. Oh, we did some bad for you and your family, here's some money. Uh, here's some land back, but out of, please don't bother me anymore. Germany has done that in many places where we hurt people through in the Second World War. And it happens again and again in so many places. Till today, like these discussions about giving back uh, art and stuff to the colonies and different countries. But it's like, oh, here's your stuff. No, stop bothering us. He doesn't say, well, I've given some kind of goodwill sign, fulfilled my oath. Okay, now I can get on with my life. No, David offers a relationship, fellowship, permanent hospitality. To eat together and to break bread together is one of the strongest symbols of community, of being part of one household. And it's still a very strong expression in many Middle Eastern cultures today. David is inviting Mephibosheth into his life into a relationship. And in ancient times, hospitality didn't just mean a cup of coffee and some cookies. It meant you share everything. It means you as a host 
take responsibility for the person under your roof, the person at your table. There are two of the most horrifying Old Testament stories, I think, that are actually about hospitality and how far it goes. I'm thinking of the story of Sodom and then a similar story later in the book of Judges, where hospitality is so strong that the host would give anything, including his beloved daughter, to keep the guests safe. In the case of our God, he gave his beloved son to keep us safe. Being a guest is very similar or sometimes even stronger than being adopted. Into the family where then everybody, including the children, will lay down their lives for you. Our God is a God of hospitality. He is our refuge. God invites us into his home, to his table, to his family. He, hears, he calls us to hear peace and forgiveness instead of fear, restoration of honor instead of shame, and safety and fellowship instead of loneliness somewhere in the shadows and the margins. He offers us a place at his table. He invites us to taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him, says Psalm 34. I think in evangelical circles, we often think of this picture that we invite Jesus into our heart. We are the host and Jesus is the guest. And I mean, they're good Verses for that, like from Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if you open the door, I will come in and eat with you and you with me. But I think the greater, much more powerful picture is if we think that God is inviting us to his table. It's not Jesus coming to our tiny little life it's us being invited into the greatness, the banquet of God. And not just in eternity, but already now into relationship, into fellowship with him and his people. He wants to hang out with us. He wants to be our friend, our family. What a blessing and what an invitation that is. So Mephobishet is at the end of the story still lame in both feet. That's the last sentence of the chapter. But everything else, everything else in his life has changed. So the remaining question is where I started. What does this story then mean for us as the body of Christ in 2023? For me personally, for Christian organizations that I am involved in, that I lead, for us as the church locally and worldwide. I think we are so often worried when we meet people with certain problems or difficulties in their life. You know, if God will speak into that particular situation, will he heal this person? Will he rescue this marriage? Will he help in this point that's so painful to this person right now? And we are so focused on that one thing that we totally miss that God wants to invite that person into something much bigger. That the much greater miracle than a healed foot is the miracle of God's kindness and restoration and the inv invitation to his family. So who is it that we need to ask about, like David asked about Mephobishet? Where do we need to send out people to find and offer the, a seat at the table to those in the margins? 
Who is it that we can offer loving kindness, restoration and fellowship to? So that they may discover, they can taste and see in our churches, in our families, what amazing gift God has for them. Who is our personal and as a congregation, who is our Mephobishet? Yes, we saw that we all carry parts of him in us. So that's step one, where we receive forgiveness, restoration, and friendship. But we shouldn't stop there. We should think about those, seek and reach out to those still in the shadows, those still suffering discrimination and injustices around us those who have not heard or responded to God's great invitation to his table. We should reach out and seek out and go after those who feel unworthy to respond to that invitation. So let's keep our eyes and hearts open and go and find the people that God wants at this table the people that God wants in these empty chairs, that people wants in community with him and with us. I want to end with reading Psalm 34. And this is a psalm from much earlier in David's life. But I think maybe it was that experience that helped him to grow in his personal faith, in his understanding of God's kindness that helped him then to be kind and fulfill his oath to Jonathan and find Mephobishet. And I think it could also be a psalm that Mephobishet himself would have agreed with or maybe even prayed. And so let us read Psalm 34. And I already quoted the most famous verse earlier that relates to come, taste, and see, but I want to read it in its wholeness. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes it boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I thought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look at him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. The poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer with want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O oh, children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days, that he may see good. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are towards the righteous and his ears towards their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are with afflictions of the, afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers, them, him, delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servant. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. 
Amen.